watercolor, correct? That's the paint that you have in your kits. <laughs> now, watercolor has been around for a very long time. And traditionally, watercolor was mixed in and kept and made in seashells. Okay? And it's it's a really nice, you know, kind of aesthetic in a way of using the seashells. I find it's um, nice also with mixing because the, the ridges of the shell allow for better mixing. What are the components of paint? You have the vehicle. You have a vehicle. Uh, the pigment. The pigment. And the binder. Okay. Watercolor uses gum arabic. Okay. Gum arabic is now this is pre ground but gum arabic is the sap of the acacia tree okay and then that sap the nodules of the sap are then ground into a powder okay so it's just a nice light powder with a little bit of a sweet scent to it okay pigments now what i have here are traditional medieval pigments, so historical pigments, and what you see, now this particular set is, is expensive because these are historic pigments, but you can buy pigments um, for, you know, just more modern pigments that are significantly cheaper. What makes them historical? Uh, here's a good example. My black is bone black, okay, which, in accordance with Il Libro dell'Arte, uh, Cennino Cennini's manuscript, uh, 15th century manuscript on the techniques of art and painting and making things, you use specific bones from chickens and you carbonize them, so you burn them until they are a just pure black mm -hmm. and then you grind that into a fine powder that makes an extremely dense black it's not vanta black but it's definitely a very dense deep black it's really wonderful black is it like sand this this is carbonized chicken bone mm -hmm. it's exactly what this is other things when it comes to traditional medieval or historic pigments is that there are certain things like for example if you wanted white modern pigments you would use titanium white traditional historic pigments would use lead white this is highly poisonous because what you're looking at And here is lead rust. This is powdered lead. Okay? You do not want to breathe that in. Yes, ma'am. I was just gonna ask that. So if you're painting with wood, you bad to well, you don't want to put the brush in your mouth like traditional medieval monks would do in order to get a fine point. No, you don't want to do that. Um, up until the end of the 19th century, lead white was pretty much the only way to get white. How many of you are familiar with like old fishing kits with the lead weights? Yeah. Um, that you know, for some of you, your grandpa, you know, your grandparents might have like you know Bye. bit down on. Uh, yeah. And if you ever notice that those sometimes, if they're older, the 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 lead weights have like a little bit of a white powder on them. Yeah. That's lead rust. Mm -hmm. The traditional method of making lead white it was a specially made um, ceramic jar that had a raised area in the middle, and they would take a a bar or a cone of lead and put it on that part and it would be raised up and there'd be kind of a, a, a dip that ran around that and they would fill it with urine to a certain point. Then they would put the lid on and they would coat the thing in dung. Mm -hmm. 
and let it sit for however long and then they would open it up and when they pulled that out it would be because of the the high acidic environment that that produces it would be completely coated in white lead rust and then you remove that and there is your pigment another lead derivative is what's called minium red lead and it's another type of lead rust and as you can see minium has a kind of orange look to it right but there's something interesting to note about minium medieval illuminators would lay out the enlarged letter with like the little landscape or the dragon or the person on the inside of it right they would lay that out first in minium and that's why those are called miniatures and then later on that's why because of the little miniature paintings inside that's where we actually get the word miniature the word miniature comes from minium red lead make sense now, another pigment that is prized. When we talk about blue, and blue as far as paint goes, for most of human history, blue only came from one source, lapis lazuli, in Afghanistan. Only a certain region of Afghanistan could you find lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli then through a very specific process would be processed into blue. There are times in history when lapis was more worth more than gold. To see what actual lapis looks like, I'm going to pass this around. This is hematite and then the round beads are lapis. Okay. Now, in more recent times, um, a, there's another source for lapis in Chile. There's Chilean lapis, but Chilean lapis looks a little bit different than Afghani lapis. Okay. The only other blue historically is what's called Mayan blue, which for a long time they weren't really sure about which components went in it. They, they do know now how it was made, and some of those components actually came from Florida. Um, but throughout Europe and Asia, blue only came from Afghanistan. And so it was highly prized. It was only ever reserved for certain things. Okay? This is about three quarters of an ounce of Afghani lazurite, lapis lazuli. This stuff runs about $80 an ounce in pigment form okay um but it makes such a wonderful blue most pigments are just simply come from the earth for example nicosia earth green italian yellow earth wonder where that's from verona green earth guess where these come from the ground. Dirt. That's it. Now there are there are organic pigments. You ever heard of lake red? Yep. You ever heard of lake being added to a co the, the name of a color? The reason is is because that term lake actually comes from the term lac, which is a type of insect that was used to derive its pigment. Now When we talk about paint and making paint, what do we need? Well, we're going to need a pigment. We're going to need a binder. So we know what our binder is, right? We're going to make watercolor, so we need gum Arabic. Now, I've already made green today. I'm not making green. I think we're going to go with violet hematite this time. Looks brown. So, now, so in order to make pigment, we need certain things. 
Hmm? Oh, sorry. Now what I have here is a set of fine measuring tools. As you can see, we have a pinch, a dash, a tad, a drop, and a smidgen. So, and that's good because it doesn't take much. One of the first things we need to do is make our binder. Now, if I really wanted to get in depth with this, I might have what's called a glass molar. Okay, I'd have a thick sheet of glass, and then I'd have this thing that's made of glass that has a very flat bottom and a handle. And you would put the pigment onto the glass, you put the molar on it, and you turn it. And this grinding would make it even finer. But since this is already fairly fine, I'm not going to worry about it. Now, to make a binder, oops, sorry, that's good. Our first step is having a little bit of gum Arabic. Next, water. Okay. Three, four, five. So I put five drops of water. Now I typically like to mix with a brush. Um, some people do, some people don't. You want to mix this to about the consistency of regular paint. Okay. Need a touch more water. Okay. Hmm. Now. And this is binder. Now to do it truly properly, we would actually let this sit overnight so that all the little grains of gum arabic truly dissolve. But since we're a little time compressed here, we're just going to leave it at that. Okay? You see? Now, Next, yep, that'll work. we need to make what's called pigment paste. Pigment paste is done with simply water and pigment, and you want to make it to the consistency of toothpaste. Different pigments require different amounts of water. So you kind of have to find what works. Uh oh. I need more water. We'll do this. Shouldn't do this, but we'll do that. So now. Like I said, you're going to mix this up until it's like toothpaste. That's the consistency you want in your pigment paste. You want it thick, like so. Now, it okay next step 
we mix our binder with our pigment paste. So now, does any of this look hard or difficult? No, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Thank you. I kind of get into this, so if I move it off camera, please excuse me. And there, I have it. I'm going to grab a little more binder. If I need to, I can add a touch more gum arabic to to thicken this up, but I'm not really going to worry about that. This seems to be about the right consistency. Remember that water will dry out. So now comes the last thing. <coughs> Medieval illuminators didn't just paint a, a painting that sat static. They painted on pages. Those pages had to be turned. If you paint it with this exactly as it is now, it's just going to flake off. You need to increase its elasticity. In order to do that, you need honey. In this amount, about a drop of honey, and that may be too much, is enough. By a little too much is going to make it a little more glossy. Sweet. <laughs> Nothing like sweet dirt um, or metal in this case, but still. Um, but with that, what you end up with is medieval style watercolor paint. If you leave it to dry, what you get is that. Yeah. Now, under correct and proper medieval methods, my next step would be create what's called a one-to-one -one ratio mix. Okay? That mix is done because ultimately when you paint in this style you use the tinted version so you tint until it's directly between the pure hue and white that middle color ends up being like this okay and if I hold it up a little bit closer you can see how I have a light version and what looks like a darker version this is the pure hue this is the tint this is the pure hue this is the tint pure hue tint got it the effect that this has and this technically you could just start painting with it right now um, but the effect is, and what's great, like these paints here, I made like over a year ago. Might even be two years ago now. But if you have water too. All I got to do is add water and reactivate them. Um, <coughs> so, let's say I go here. And the great thing is, like, you know, it did, doesn't look like I made that much paint, did I? But... The wonderful thing about it is, when you're working with watercolor, it doesn't take much. Draw a dog. Well, right now, I'm just going to show you some simple techniques. Two. 
So, you see it comes out light, right? Mm -hmm. And if I want to add a shadow, I use the pure hue because medieval painters did not mix colors. You use them as God intended the way they were provided to you. The only thing you're allowed to mix with them is white and you never shade a color. You can use black but you cannot mix it. That's called sullying. Your color is what they referred to it. But when I add the darker or the pure hue, I can create what appears like a shadow. <coughs> See? Does that make sense? I can then use black to come in and add things. I can use a pure white to highlight if I so choose. Does that make sense? And somebody move the mouse on that, please. So. Thank you. <coughs> and there you go. That's it. That is, that's how easy it is to make paint. It's really that simple. Not much to it, is there? And while it may be a little more expensive to buy like, individual pigments and the binders, your advantage is they keep. They really do keep. So you don't have to worry about it separating. You don't have to worry about it just totally drying out and being useless. You know exact the exact chemical makeup of this. So there's no odd additive to it or anything like that. But this is how medieval illuminators and painters would make paint. If I wanted to make oil paint, instead of using gum Arabic, I might use linseed oil. If I wanted to make encaustic, I'd mix these pigments with beeswax. Make sense? And that is how it was done. Are there any questions? What about fresco? Fresco is typically used as a slightly different pigment but not too much different and it's just mixed with wet plaster technically you could use these pigments mixed with wet plaster but there are special fresco pigments so now at this time if you want you are welcome to come up and you can get a touch of water use a brush here and uh, or if you want to try the uh, the paint that I made right here, you are welcome to do so. I'm just going to move the the white out of the way, the lead white. Um, please don't. Please do though. Try not to get the paint on your hands, especially with these one to ones, because the tinted ones, because they do contain lead. Okay. And there you go. Hold on one moment and I'll be stopping.